It's also an art form to feel your lover. It's an art form how you express your beauty. Devotion is also, I can see the divinity, the goodness in the other person no matter what. We are not doing it to save anything or anybody. We're doing it out of love. The energy to create a child is the same energy that can be used to co-create a new paradigm. There is life all around me. This is life force. This is making love with the moment. I'm going to admit something I should not be saying, but I'm going to say it right now. I didn't admit this to you. I'm actually... Uh... Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> no one that's normal and sane would ever give me a platform. So you know what I have to do? I have to create my own platform, right? What's up, everyone? Welcome to Nowhere Nomads episode number two. Yes, that's it. I'm still here. I hope you enjoyed the last episode with Robin, former economic hitman, friend of the Rockefellers. I'm still here, so I guess they haven't heard of it yet. Okay, so this episode, we're going to be delving into it with Tia. Yes, T-H-E-A is pronounced Tia. This whole time, I was pronouncing her name wrong, Thea, and she just corrected me. I don't know if it's because she's just so nice or I'm just that much of an idiot. But anyway, Tia was a big inspiration for this. You look at the words co-create, you look at alchemize, all these different concepts. Those came from her, from all her sessions on Sense Making 101 and all her talks. This project, this Noetic Nomads project, this is really a co-creation between myself, her, Robin, everyone that I encountered in Rebel Wisdom, the Stoa, Game B community, biohacking community, everyone. In this episode, you'll get to see what it was that inspired all this stuff. And this co-creation, this is what I wanted to do with Noetic Nomads at a community. At first, it was just like, hey, I'm just gonna start a YouTube channel. Then it was just like, oh, I can now do a podcast and a website. Tia was like, but then you could add all this other stuff to the website. And I was like, all right, sure. And now we have the Noetic Nomads community and noeticnomads.org. You could go there, you could submit your articles, you could submit your events, start your own group. I mean, we have new features coming in all the time. I'd love to hear your feedback, your ideas. Come on over. Everything's free. No algorithms except whatever is worrying around up here. No ads, no nothing. It's all for you. Tia dropped some real bombs on this episode. She was initiated into the tantric tradition in India in her early 20s. She's the real deal. She's been doing this for a long time. Whatever we think of as tantra in the West, that is not at all what it is, we go into what it really means to practice Tantra, to do the breath work, to really co-create with your partner. And the 24 seven orgasm thing doesn't hurt either. I started the breath work with her last week and I've been practicing every day. No Kundalini explosions yet, but already I feel an opening, an emptying, a groundedness, all things I need work on. Be on the lookout at Noetic Nomads. This won't be the last time you hear from Thea. Her gifts need to be shared with the world. And I wanna make sure that everyone's chakras are open the <laughs> up. I also make a bit of a crazy confession on this episode. If you I was weird before. Sorry, you don't know the half. You can watch the episode on YouTube, or if you're on the go, or you don't want to see my ugly face, you can listen to the podcast on iTunes or Spotify. Search for Nobetic Nomads and give us five stars so I can keep embarrassing myself every week. All right, let's do this. See you soon. Recording. Welcome, everyone, to another brand spanking new episode of Nobetic Nomads. I'm Albert Kim, your host that most definitely be doing the most. And with me today is someone who was a big inspiration for my starting this project. Uh, she's a lifelong world traveler, a holistic personal chef steeped in world cuisine, such as that of Morocco, France, India, Thailand, and Italy. A spiritual seeker versed in Ayurveda and Tantra, a pediatric nurse, breathwork therapist, multi-hyphenate and manifestation of the divine feminine, just to name a few things. Nomads, please put your hands together wherever you are to help me introduce the one, the only, Thea Dixon. Thank you so much for coming on today. Oh, Albert, thank you <laughs> for having me. This is such, just such an amazing lesson. You are my inspiration. Oh my God, thank you so much. I mean, you're an inspiration. I mean, you heard what I just read right there, right? I mean, like, please, I mean, please, you're a huge inspiration. Uh, thank you so much. And um, so please, in your own words, can you let these lovely people know how you came to know this weird Korean guy over here? 
Okay, well, we were just uh, connected through Rebel Wisdom, and uh, we did this incredible course that really opened for me my awareness to even more newness and more uh, things that I've never heard before. And so we met and they put us into some kind of group and I was on the east, I was on the west coast and you were on the east coast yeah. and I thought I was in the wrong group. <laughs> You're like, oh, man, get, me get me out of here. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. What am I doing with these, you know, it's the wrong, wrong time zone. I have to get up early, which I did on Saturday yeah. morning at I 6. I know, I could tell, yeah. Um, it was just, and it was just a delight being with the two of you and I just felt like the spark uh, from you the moment we just got together. Yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> oh, yeah, same here, same here. It was amazing. And so what exactly was it that attracted you to Rebel Wisdom in the first place? Um, I really feel like, you know, we are at this, of course, most um, magic time, unprecedented but magic time in history, mm. Which I say this, and some people might be shocked, but that's okay. Like, you know, I feel like I'm waiting for this for a very long time, and it makes mm. me almost a little tearful. And I go into that a little later because I had some interesting experiences growing up in Germany in my, as a teenager that I just felt like there was something else that something else that I wanted to happen, I wanted to experience, and I also wanted to contribute as a teenager and it also made me sometimes a little bit, um, you know, doomed kind of because I felt there was something inside me um, really wanting to come out. And of course I had no idea what that was, but um, so, and this was rebel wisdom. It was for me like the next step in, from an evolutionary point of view, from a um, human potential point of view that I said, yes, I'm, I, signed up the night before by accident my friend gave yeah. me her ticket because she couldn't participate so i'm like yay you know this is meant to be i didn't really know what was happening i only knew in myself like i just want to be there so that's probably um, yeah i mean i know i know exactly what you're talking about when you're being like i was preparing for this moment like i'm not joking when i say like literally like 15, 15 years ago, I was like, I'm preparing for the apocalypse. Like I was physically, mentally, and spiritually training literally for this moment right here. Like, you know, like the reason why I lift weights is like, yo, I gotta, I gotta protect myself. I gotta protect everyone around me. I gotta be fit for this. And so I understand totally what you're talking about. And like what you stated right there. Um, cause I remember you talking about like in, Re in the sense making one one that like you knew since I believe you were 16, you said since you were a teenager that the world was wrong. And like, I, I, like, like I said, like I relate, and I'm sure that many, if not most, if not all of our audience is, relates that there's something wrong. That's why they're attracted to this kind of like a uh, uh, material, this kind of content. So what was it about the world around you that troubled you so deeply? Yeah, I like, I like the word troubled, you know, mm. because if you look at it from an evolutionary point of view and also non-dualistic, I like to mm. be as, you know, integral as possible is like I just there was something that was actually hurting inside of me starting with recycle you know I started to become a recycle freak at 14 because I was aware what we are doing to the mother to the earth how we are basically polluting the planet. I was very aware, uh, again, growing up in Germany and the news of there very different at a young age of under 10, I was aware that there was poverty and children dying of hunger and children haven't been eating. I was aware of that at a very young age. And I just felt like, I want to do something about this. This isn't right, you know? And then it feels like living in the first world. It just feels almost like I had a bit of a bad conscience, you know, that I felt like, okay, and I understood. So we living like this, and this is a very short percentage. We exploiting those countries and those countries don't eat. They have no houses, right? So, I think I, I, I became, you know, obviously as a 10 year old, you process this in a different way, but I guess it saddened me. And even to the point that it actually hurt, if that makes sense, you know, that to see children of hunger, you know, at that age, you just wonder, 
why is my dad not doing anything about it? Why is nobody doing anything about that? That were my question at that age. No? Yeah, I mean, like, and um, you stated that where you were growing up, you, you know, you saw all this and you became aware of all this. Um, can you inform the audience about uh, where you grew up and how specifically did that impact the choices that you made in your life and your career? Mm -hmm. So I grew up in the near the old capital of Germany, which is Bonn. Mm -hmm. And um, I had um, a lot of more, I want to say, already multicultural background in growing up that I was aware of different cultures and I was always interested in that and I traveled from a young age as well and um, I got informed um, I was my I really was interested in geology and so my dad oh. talked to me about geology and you know and things like that it was kind of his favorite thing and he would always get the 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 the, the world map up and showed me where different countries were you know so I was kind of aware of that and I think those experiences um I had, I, it was almost like it created a hunger for change in me, oh, you know, like that I felt like I want to do something about it. And it felt almost like I didn't doubt in my mind that that was possible. And I doubted, you know, my, maybe even my parents, or I doubted society that it had to be this way. I just felt like it can't, I, I just didn't want to settle for it to be this way. Mm. So then, you know, when I was 16, we talk about rebel wisdom, I definitely was a rebel. I shook up my parents' paradigm or their belief systems, and I was very, um, very vocal about that. And I chose um, to go to different schools at a young age. Uh, mm. I chose to go to a a more further away school at the age of 11 where I had to take train for 20 minutes and had to walk for 20 minutes mm. to get to the school at the age of 11 just because I wanted to be closer to the big city and uh, that also exposed me to a different you know different people very different than the village that I grew up to and um, and I just feel like if you're asking me that I always felt inside of me I, I just knew what, but there was something, it was possible. I just knew it was possible. And, I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, actually now this, all these puzzle pieces start to make sense because you talk about how like you went to like geology and your dad would bring out the map. And this started your whole life path of just going all over, you know, like, you know, going all over and like uh, traveling the world. And like, um, so from what I read, like you read, uh, you left for India in your 20s. So I'm curious, like, why India? What was it about India? That inspired you so much? India popped up for me when I was 17 because, in fact, my parents traveled to India oh. and uh, they brought back these tankas, you know, the Tibetan tankas, which probably most people know, but they're like these mandalas painted on, on sometimes silk or behind silk. And they're literally meditations. They might take months for monks to paint. And you look in this mandala and it literally feels like everything opens up. Right. So my parents brought this back as art, but for me, I would sit in front of them. And I'm like, whoa. I mean, something was like inspiring me, mm -hmm. opening me, I think opening and, um, just feeling they opened up a whole new world. And so I'm like, I need to go there. Um, and maybe I should bring this in here since you mentioned earlier, Tantra. So yes. the word Tantra is almost like, I, I personally use it just because I haven't found a better word, but it's what we understand here in Tantra in the West is nothing about when I use the word Tantra and what it really means from the ancient traditions. But what happened for me is that I was realizing in Germany, it was all very liberal, very progressive. And um, my girlfriends, they all had intimate relationships. And I'm like, at just hearing about it and just experiencing it. I want to say more on an energetic level. I felt like, again, there is so much more. I'm not interested mm. in this. I'm like, and uh, having actually been in um, schools where there were nuns, I'm like, oh, maybe I have oh, to wow. become a nun because this <laughs> is just not, this is just not what I wanted to do. You know, it's like, 
I can go, could go more in detail, but I think everybody knows what I'm talking about. Yeah. And so again, I just knew there must be something else. So I just wanted to go to India just from a pure energetic sense of seeing art, of going into museums and seeing art. And then I had the chance at 25 and I literally walked in from intensive care into a three week Vipassana retreat uh, oh, wow. in Bodh Gaya in India. And I just, I was just like, I'm home, I'm home, I'm finally home. It just felt like after 25 years, I was home. And I was going for five weeks and going back to Germany to work. And I decided I'm not going anywhere. And I quit my job and stayed for six months studied Ayurveda, studied Tantra, mm -hmm. got initiated in the more like traditional way, especially so Ayurvedic practices. And so, yeah, so that just got me started. I mean, yeah, I mean, like, I definitely, that's definitely one of the things I want to talk to you about Tantra. And obviously, like, like you said, a lot of people in the West, they think about Tantra, they think about like some funky, weird, funky sex stuff, right? And that's what I thought at first. And then I yeah, actually- oh, it's like yeah yeah and then like i actually like did some research and i was like oh wait tantra is like like i can't explain but it's like the basis of like stuff like uh like zen buddhism and like even taoism and it's just like it's like super ancient and it's just like like the basis of so many things so i mean okay so i mean so and the way that uh i actually what i found is you did a course uh about the uh the, the embodied art of tantra and awakening your bliss body your tagline was it was sexuality in Western culture offers us very little of what is possible from what is known and practiced in Eastern traditions for thousands of years. And then what your course highlighted, this is very interesting, how Eros relates to conscious evolution and the creation of a new paradigm. So I'd love to hear more on what you mean by this. Uh, but, uh, so please, can you start by telling us what uh, your definition of Tantra is? Um. My definition of Tantra is when you, when we talk about, let's go to the bliss body, right? What we mm. think of, what we think of bliss, right? Uh, so I'm just getting a little explicit here. The bliss is like uh, 30 seconds of some kind of almost outer body experience, mm. right? And then you're just waking up and you're like, okay, then, you know, and then you want it again and you're chasing something that you feel you can't actually maintain, that you also feel a little bit out of control. And to call 30 seconds bliss is kind of a little short lift, mm -hmm. right? So that, that's number one. Number two, the, the, the art of Tantra, first of all, it's, a, it's an art form. It's also an art form to feel your lover, it's an art form how you express your beauty as a woman or as a man and really being in there for the other person and how evolution, uh, I like it, you know, the this, this sentence instead of at this point in time to really question, do we want to procreate or do we want to co-create? And the energy to create a child is the same energy that can be used to co-create a new paradigm and consciously wow. participating our consciousness. And that means if I open my bliss body, which is the, um, the energetic body, which is basically the chakra system, I'm opening that up and bringing all that life force instead of just to the second chakra, which is where we create a child, um, a new being. We creating that past that point through the heart all the way up. And that way we also connecting with the cosmic energy, which some mm -hmm. of you, I'm just, just going out here, even are aware of the toroidal field. So we actually becoming part with this energy. We activating the pineal gland with mm -hmm. the active life force, which is Eros. That's what Eros means. It's the evolutionary impulse. It's uh, Barbara Marx Hubbard created this words, the evolutionary impact. For me, it's like that life force that makes me get, wake up in the morning. I'm sitting here on a Minnesota lake and there is life all around me. This is life force. This is making love with the moment, right? But mm -hmm. it's using that making love into a new paradigm and becoming aware what amazing possibility this body actually has 
inside internally where our pineal gland is called that this is the gland that actually has the ability where we downloading and receiving information in co-creation with the cosmos wow so much there yeah um like yeah, um, uh was a descartes he talked about he he posited that he thought the the pineal gland was like the interface between the brain and like the universe and all that and like i mean there's so much there and like oh my god i completely lost what i was talking about <laughs> but uh, <laughs> there's like there's like so much there and like yeah i mean about when you talked about how love is being creation i mean i want to circle back on that later but that, that, that's kind of like how i'm starting to see it and like how you said that tantra is just way more than sex way more than this you know a few seconds of you know the bliss in the second uh, chakra it's way more than that and something I want to follow up on that, which is very interesting to me, is that you stated that um, these practices don't require you to be in an intimate relationship. Traditionally, they're explored with yourself first and then apply to any sexual orientation. It also serves your relationships, including your work. Now, how this all ties in is because uh, I'm going to admit something, which, again, to this current paradigm, to the Western world, I should not be saying, but I'm going to say it right now. I didn't admit this to you. Um, I'm actually, uh, I'm, I just turned 36 years old and I'm actually a virgin. I've never been in a romantic relationship. I've never been on a date and I've never had, a, uh, I've never kissed anyone in my life. Now, what I said, <laughs> when people hear that, they're like, that's a little crazy. Exactly. That's why I'm doing this right now. Cause I'm crazy. And the reason how that ties in is cause like my whole life, like, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't feel like it was necessarily necessary for me, but, but when, when you say it about Tantra, how traditionally these practices, they don't require you to be in an intimate relationship. You can explore with yourself first. And I'm like, maybe this is why I feel like people, like they, they come across me, they're like, oh my God, you have so much energy. You're all like this, like that is maybe because I'm like channeling that energy, which is supposed to come out of here. And I'm just Beautiful. going like love this. It. So like, I would love to hear your take on that. Like, I would yeah. just love to hear it. I totally agree. Congratulations. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I came out the closet. <laughs> <laughs> and this is beautiful. Yeah. So, yes, exactly. Um, for just to go on that line, Napoleon, right? He oh, knew yeah. about this and he would not ejaculate four weeks before he would go into battle mm -hmm. because he is aware that he would lose all his life potency. Mm -hmm. I have spoken to lots of men that say, yeah, I feel like exhausted. I feel drained mm -hmm. and it's not working for me. Right. Actually, you know, it's like, and, and not only that, if we go on a health point of view from a health perspective is you using all your vital life force. Right. So then there's obviously this huge thing about, you know, bypassing ejaculation which is a huge tantric Taoist practice yeah. that people practice for hundreds of years that I recommend to anybody. And um, I'm teaching that too. Uh, mm. And for women, it's, I found it a little easier, but it also means that the, coming back to what we said earlier, you know, we only usually stay in the first uh, lower chakras and by low it's not low up and down you know it's just you know that using it that way and then we bringing it through the heart and bringing life force or eros or sexual energy through the heart actually opens literally like a lotus and connects us to the divine and also connects us to the other person I mean, if we, I mean, I only know my experience, you know, and I mean, a lot of people I've spoken to, it's like, you have intimacy with someone else, but afterwards it's flat. It's actually no longer alive because it's exactly what you said. And you might be naturally circulating your energy. I don't know. We can find yeah. out, you know, where you have all that energy. And even if you don't do that, you are not basically losing it instead of saying wasting let's say losing it into nothing versus channeling it up which we do through the spine through the mm. spinal cord it, there's a central channel called shushumna and that's where we're bringing it actually up to the pineal gland and then we have an orgasm actually in the pineal gland it's a much gentler it's gentler it's not this kind of um oh this is beautiful this is my favorite thing actually so 
most of us know that the, the I call it conventional orgasm, which we talked about earlier, you know, the 30 second thing, um, is like a um, really strong sensation, yeah? So in and when, once we open the bliss body, not only can you have this 24 seven, you can literally move your life force all the time, but it's a much more gentle wave. And this is why I, I chose the waves behind you. Imagine actually that behind you, I, now I know why I chose that. Yeah, right here. <laughs> like, this is imagine that is your orgasm moving up your spine into your body brain into the pineal out of the head and back in so you circulating that I see. and you circulating that with another being but you can also circulate this with nature you can mm. circulate this what you've been doing with life itself and that's what i feel from you you have this 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 incredible not thirst you are actually giving life you are so mm. energetic that i feel actually almost you know like nurtured by your energy oh. because you're moving it and you're giving it yeah so versus like like losing it by just having this for yourself and actually depleting your body of energy now i want to make really clear there's nothing wrong in having this orgasm but it's nice to have a choice I and see. most people do not have the choice. They have discovered their bliss body. They don't know how to move those waves. And what's very interesting too, we are moving light. We are moving mm. light. We are moving love really through our system. And so coming back, that is anti-aging. That is like people want to be around you. You want to be around people. Mm. You notice who you are. You notice you are not separate. You know we are all one. So it really opens up your consciousness and it opens up to when we get together that we, sh that we, that we communicate even with this energy. We don't, you know, all this communication with words and, and all of that is that, you know, when you, it's that thing, you meet somebody and it's like, you know, you just feel alive. Yes, and it's, it's pre-verbal, exactly. Yes, you know, exactly. You know, and then yeah. we often think like, oh, we want sex or you feel, you feel even turned on, but there is so much more to that turned onness right? Mm. That we then again might express through a fling or maybe it ends up in a marriage, whatever. But then we realize that's short lived as well. So coming back to what you said earlier, if I practice this by myself, I have already, I'm already full. I'm already coming from a loving space that I want to share you and bring the best out in you. So if two people come together from that perspective, even making a child, imagine what that would be like. Creating a child, not by accident, not because you have to, not because it's societal, you know, but to really bring a child in the world because you want that. You know, you really bring that and you're conscious about that. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. Yeah, so um, um, that means you have the choice when you want to do what and in the meantime you have the most amazing health tool that really rejuvenates and imagine especially if you look at the um, the semen the whole fluid of a man it produces a child so it has the most valuable nutrition literally it contains the valuable mm -hmm. condition imagine you can actually pull this back into your body and that's what you do by bypassing and pulling it literally back into your spine, moving it up. And for the woman, it's the same. She, you know, there is, there is also the energetics for women. It's a little different, but the same thing, they're pulling the energy back up and bringing it in. And then if men and women come together, it's a different circle because we are magnets. Yeah, we are poles, different poles. And at the same time, we can create also harmonious energy that then again elevates us into a level of higher consciousness and not using each other's to for self gratification nothing wrong with that i just want to give you some other options yeah 
I mean, yeah, it's a pretty, it's a pretty good option. I mean, like, and um, like one of the things that I got from you through all of our, our talks in the Sense of Making One One is like, you constantly talked about co-creation and co-creation. And like, I'm trying to, and that's why I even joined because for a long time, like how you talk about how like you bring the love into yourself. And like, I was doing it. Like I imagined like in my body for years that my heart was just like this infinite like output of love and out, but it was like circulating in myself. And it was just, it was like, I was love, I was learning to love myself and healing myself. And, but then I was like, one day, okay. It's like, okay, this is so much. Like I got to bring someone else. So now it's like how you're talking about bring someone else into it. Now we're connected now. And now it's not just this, it's doing this. And then, and then eventually it's going to be like that. So I guess kind of like what I'm doing here, you know, when I'm trying to bring everyone together with, with this love, which I don't know where it's coming from, but, you know, maybe coming from where So, we so beautiful, Al, because that's what I felt from you the first time I met. You were just literally, you know, pouring love into me and making me happy to be alive. You have that incredible energy you know and what i want to say about that too you know i know a little bit about you you know and your commitment to yourself and the commitment that you work through stuff yeah. you know or you work through yeah. conditioning you know yeah. and it's uh, and it seems like you did this naturally without having words to it. Mm. And I think that actually happened for a lot of us. And it happened for me when in my 20s, I mm. just knew I intuited. And I just found over the last 30 years, words to this and being with teachers and saying, oh, right, great, great, great. You know, someone is putting words to it. And I'm yes. sure a lot of the people that are listening, it's just like, oh, yes, I know, I know, I know. But we haven't been given words. And the words of really acknowledging that the energetics that I'm receiving from you and actually naming that and not being shy to say, hey, you make me fully alive, mm. right? In a different way that I just felt like when I got on this call with you at 7 a.m. on Saturday morning, <laughs> You I know, I'm you like, there. I'm like, whoa, you know, let's, and, and I really received that as a gift. So you've been doing all of that. And of course, once we can put um, language to it, and I believe we even can find new language that is more intimate, that is actually being intimate without being conventionally intimate. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And that is connecting by me saying to you as a total stranger, you make me really feel alive and this mm. is your gift to me and I'm receiving it. Oh my God. I feel the love so much. I mean, I can feel, I mean, I really appreciate that. And like, you know, it, it makes me feel good that I could, you know, like I could, you know, bring that love to you and help you feel that. And I, you know, like I'm, I'm always freaking self-doubting myself. And I guess that's a good thing because I'm like, there's always that shadow, you know, how we're talking about the course, that shadow. I'm like, I want to love people, but there's still like that, that little boy who's just, you know, so scared. And he just like, I still, I feel like I'm doing this for selfish reasons and I'm scared of being hurt. I'm scared of putting myself out there. But like, when I hear stuff, how you say that I, I help you come alive. I'm like, wow, this, this really is my gift. It really it inspires me to keep doing it. So, so thank you so much. Um, so, I mean, so, I mean, like, as influenced, as, as evidenced by what, uh, you know, you've been talking about, how all these different things that you do in my intro, how about you're a chef, a nurse, a tantra teacher, Ayurvedic practitioner, nutrition wellness coach, a dancer. I mean, like, you're all these different things, right? And like, it's just like, what exactly is it that compels you to go down all these paths? Like, what is the common thread that leads you to go through all these different, seemingly disparate paths? But like, what is the common thread for you? That's what I'm curious about. Um, a lot of it is, I guess, I do have a passion for life. I, mean, I have, I've, I'm sensing this evolutionary impulse, and I always experience it when I say evolutionary impulse. I'm seeing um, like a rod, you know, when you take an electricity cable, and that when you open it, there is these, there is these little, little um, things coming out. Yeah, I don't sure. know what you call them, the right? Wi the wires, the, the wires, yeah. the wires, yeah. right? And that feels aliveness there. There is this aliveness to me. So, uh, and for me, uh, dance, I particular dance in the soul mm. motion, the soul motion tradition. Um, 
is like that is um, it's again connecting with another by really tuning in to the connected field to the unified field whatever you want it and allowing yourself to being danced it's not oh, doing see, yeah. it's not doing mm, right and mm. that's ultimately making love if i am chasing an orgasm i'm completely outcome oriented usually i'm in my head i'm waiting for something i can't really be there to experience the bliss wave wow, that I'm behind, yeah? Yeah. It, like that that bliss because i'm so um and also i really want everybody to think of how much are you connected to the other person the closer you come to the climax how much are you connected to the other person and what happens when you climb when you climax mm. what is actually happening afterwards just to explore that next time and see what happens versus you can even climax by moving the energy and again it's a different it's a different experience and can you maybe be open to that experience you can always go back but again you can you have kind of both and um the connection that opens and it will be a very different experience that it's an experience i can't describe mm. right uh, i remember when my tantra teacher um gave me the practice to be basically um I don't know how she worded it, like to be celibate and also have no self-pleasuring for three weeks. It, I, I, it just felt like, you know, and she said that's only the beginning. And I had some kind of resistance that had actually to do with conditioning. And it also had to do, in my personal case, to do, coming to your question, I'm like, what 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 brought me to all of that i um, obviously as all of us i had um, kind of a difficult childhood and i never felt connected to my mother or to the rest of my family mm. not only physically but not emotionally or anything like that but i was yearning for that and i i guess i had um sadness around that and i felt lonely um, I think that all actually on some other level was, an, um, was a catalyst for me to, I just knew it existed, you know, I just knew it existed. You wanted that, you wanted I, And I right. wanted yeah, that, I so, but, so, but by not having it, it showed me that I really wanted that. But then, you know, and in my seven, I was 17, I guess, but I don't want it that way there is something else. It was more all of an, on a non-verbal experience, which also had to do with my, if you want to call it trauma or whatever. And I understood by listening to my Buddhist and Tibetan teachers that there was a reason why I went through this. There was a reason why we human beings go through that amount of suffering mm, or disconnection yeah. at such a young age. That I was curious. And also being a pediatric ER nurse, I saw a lot of children dying. And so I wanted to understand that. At the same time, having been with children dying, they had a completely different perspective of dying that wasn't frightened, that wasn't scared. Mm -hmm. And it was an extreme, extreme, extraordinary experience to be with birth and death on a, in a very... Um, you know, a life way. I mean, it was, it was like, there was a lot of births, there was a lot of deaths. And I was, I was like 20, you know, from 20 till 26, I had those experiences. And so um, I just knew there was kind of something else. Um, and it's that red thread that I felt like, you know, I knew I was, I, I knew there was the divine, however you want to call that. We all have a different name, unified field source. It's all the same. Um, but I also sensed, especially in India through devotion and chanting. I like Indian chanting like Kirtan, um, that devotion and that opening of the heart. 
um, that I didn't experience necessarily in my society um, and in my family. But we, I know it's there, possibly similarly to you. You know it's there. And I guess I can only say it breathed me. It, it, it made me, you know, trust. It made me believe. I think mm -hmm. I believe. I never gave up, you know, even through the hardest of experiences. It's almost like this, this I have a sense of, you know, there is an unstoppableness in me um and i also want to say you know we talk about shadow from a tantric perspective the shadow the medicine is in the shadow and mm. what i see is that whatever my soul has chosen to come here to alchemize which meaning we alchemizing from lead into gold and i'm alchemizing pain and patterns into love yes yeah yes. so yeah, I mean, I complete. I mean, yeah, there's so much there, and like, uh, thank you so much for like sharing your story, and like, I completely, you know, like we talk about how you, you know there's something there, so that's why you keep going, and you already know about my long struggle. I was like, I was like, I was like mentally, physically, and like spiritually destroyed, but I just kept going. I was like, I don't know, just whatever, keep going, and then like, at each step, I'm like, just like new possibilities opening up, and like. I get to this, I, we, we meet in sense making one one and all of a sudden, I, who, who predicted this? So, yeah, I mean, it's amazing. And I, like I said, like, as I said in the beginning, like you were a big inspiration uh, for me starting this. Um, if you recall, like, remember uh, we had that prompt, uh, we were supposed to like speak about, uh, I believe a cultural issue. And then I spoke about, uh, uh, about the, the current conversation about race in America. And I said, like, as an East Asian, as a, a Korean American, my viewpoint is not represented, like, pretty much at all. It's pretty much like, a, 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 right now, it's like a black viewpoint, and then different voices within the black viewpoint, and then a white viewpoint, different voices within the white viewpoint. But like me, it's just like, I agree with a little bit here and a little bit here, but there's a whole lot here that you are not going. Um, so it was just like, and you were like, I gave my speech, and you're like, wow, Albert, that was pretty awesome. I mean, thank you for that. And just like, you're right. Like, like that, your voice, we don't have your voice. They should like rebel wisdom should speak to you. They have all these other people with resident wisdom. They should speak to people like you. And I was like, really me? It's like, who am I? Like, who am I? Like, no one's ever going to speak to me. And just like, then I was like, wait a minute. No one's ever like, no one that's normal and sane would ever give me a platform. So you know what I have to do? I have to create my own platform, right? And I gotta bring people who don't have their voices, like you, like Robin, like all these other people that I wanna have on here. So thank you for your big inspiration for that. And like, what I'm leading to is that like, one of the topic that was brought up recently, uh, I, I saw you comment in the Rebel Wisdom Circle, and I brought it up in the Stoa Discord as well, was women in a Rebel Wisdom and the sense-making space and how like, their voices are just not being heard. It's just you know, like every single, like this is like the revolving door of like the same people over and over. I'm not gonna name names, but you know, you look around, you see it's the same thing every time. So like, I wanna know like, I wanna know your thoughts on like the current state of the presence of women in our community. Okay, so you're speaking specifically on the, on the rebel wisdom community, yeah? No, but like, like or the whole sense of community and just in society right. in general, I love to speak on the, like, whatever feels alive for you. Right, right, okay. Wow. So this is, <laughs> this can be a very big issue yes. um, because also as a woman, I, um, yes, we had 5,000 years of patriarchy mm. uh, from a tantric perspective that is even, you know, very clear what happened 5,000 years ago. Then we have the whole Adam and Eve story and the woman bit the apple and we are the, the woman created the problem, you know, and then we have Lilith. And so we could go into all that, but hopefully another time. Um, <laughs> There's also the part, you know, that um, because of that, we women have to almost like come out again. We have to almost like go mm. back to our roots, go back actually to our bodies. The, our bodies are actually the feminine, meaning that your body as a man is like still, it's a fem, it has a feminine exactly. quality. The yes. body is feminine. The mind is more the masculine principle. And I'm speaking in big capital here, right? And whatever I'm saying has nothing to do with what gender you are. It is just 
has more to do with feminine capital F, feminine masculine. And then, you know, we have also different, um, I want to say, I'm looking out at nature here. Mm, um, yeah. I'm, uh, we also have, you know, we could, for example, just to categorize a little bit, there's some women that have a very high maybe percentage of feminine energy mm -hmm. and other women, they have less. Men and women, it's the same thing, right? So I'm just talking in, the, in those terms. I want to make that clear. So that also means that as a woman, I have to really be aware of how much I identified consciously, unconsciously with the masculine world, including especially the corporate world, mm. if I'm a woman that works in the corporate world, right? How much I'm in touch with my body, how much I'm in touch with my wisdom that actually lies in my womb, mm. how much I'm actually, I'm going right out here, how much I'm in touch with my breasts that are related to the heart, that holding the heart energy. Mm. And what a relationship do I have with my moon cycle? Uh, this is something in our society still in 2020, where I'm hiding my moon cycle, where I'm, you know, no, where I'm no longer bleeding on the earth, I actually have to cover it up. It's an inconvenience. We have to reclaim that and take that time, which I have over my whole life, and actually know when my cycle is. I actually schedule downtime in and meditate it and be in relationship with the moon around that, the ritual, the moon right? So I have to make time for that and not overrun my body, my cycle, my wisdom that lies in my womb. So that's a responsibility that I see that would have huge effect reclaiming that and being in tune and making decisions from there, not from here, not from yes. what's good for the company, and ignoring my body mm -hmm. and seeing something sacred that I consider as sacred, menstruating to me as sacred, seeing that as an inconvenience and our relationship to this. And there's our power is in there. And that's real power that a lot of us women, I had to reclaim that, but I did this very, at a very young age um, to reclaim that as sacred and everything that comes along with that. Wow. Uh, that is beautiful. And like, I actually read, I don't know if you saw in the rebel wisdom discord, someone actually posted a topic on that and they said they had never seen anyone bring it up before about how in order to like make, in order to be uh, proper sense makers in the coming age, uh, women are going to have to talk about their menstrual cycles. And like, I really didn't understand but like now, like with your explanation, it's like, it's being in touch with like, with yourself, not this, not that, not these, you know, external goals, but really being in touch with yourself. So uh, that was beautiful. And like, uh, what you stated, it, it goes perfectly. Like, like I remember, um, I gave that, like, I came up with this conception about how like, it was an inversion of the creation myth. And exactly what you just talked about how, instead of the female as the creator who gives birth, it's the male God. And then the female from her body comes the original human, which is actually the female. All people are born as female in the womb, you know, and it's just the whole thing. And like, I, I, I went on with like how the female created the male as a tool. Like he builds, he defends, uh, he lives in his head, he performs calculations. And that what males are doing now is they're continuing this pattern where now males are creating artificial intelligence which is even more in his head, even more abstract about all uh, performing calculations and that they're going to take us over. And then that, I mean, like, and then what you stated about how like female, they have to, they have to take charge. They have to take responsibility. And then just like, that's why I'm like, women's voices need to be heard. And also like, if I could just say like, it's important that women have to take responsibility for like, for their original sin, which was not the biting of the apple. It was the, it was like giving it over to the man. It's like, 
by creating man in the first place. The original sin was the creation of the male. So they're going to be like, okay, let's bring it back. Male, get back in line. Let's not destroy ourselves with AI and let's keep this thing going for the future. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, coming to that, you know, so I, I'm really big on co-creation. That means we had also matriarchy, we had patriarchy mm -hmm. in the past, right? So I'm ready for a new paradigm on the masculine and the feminine. Mm -hmm. I don't want the patriarchy. I don't want the matriarchy. Yeah, but yeah. This is where I'm saying, if we start making love in a way that I described earlier, it will open our whole consciousness to honoring each other much more or not much more honoring each other for who we are mm, exactly. and then co-create it will be a completely different experience mm. right by where we come together and value each other's let's say the feminine intuition and the masculine directiveness and the masculine presence you know this incredible presence yeah. And uh, I mean, there's all these amazing movies coming out too, like, m m what is it called? Mulan? I just, oh, saw, I just saw, I saw Mulan. <laughs> yeah, it was just, you know, but can you see how the feminine wasn't glorified there? Exactly. It was, it exactly. was one of the best movies in that, that men and women were actually equally, but this lady she for, she had to become a man then you know and everything mm. she did it's just beautifully explained in that movie how this could actually look like and that we can that we can live next to each other in an equal way because women it's we still not equal but it has a lot to do like i said with how much our womb and our heart is uh, is is um cultivated and we cultivating it by moving eros by moving life force through our bodies as this is meant to be and that is to me for a lot of people still a new paradigm and a new way and i'm just like let's come together and uh practice this it's not that hard you can always go back and that's where the co-creation that you're speaking about earlier um that's how we co-create from the heart not from self-interest not from overpowering another country not from using resources and then living a life that is completely unsustainable that wants more and more and the heart is actually empty and i don't even know how to connect with my neighbor mm, exactly yeah i mean yeah because like um and to, to, to add on to that, it's just like, I hear a lot like in all these spaces, right? Like in like the game B world, there are people like, we have to save civilization with the safe civilization. And like, you know, there's this dichotomy between the way I say it is that men build civilization and women build community. Here's the thing. We don't need civilization, but we need community. Without community, we're destroyed. So like, I, like I said, like I'm all about the co-creation, right? So, but like, we really need like, the, the women, the female, the, that energy that really has to come into her fullness. And then we got we to gotta, uh, uh, integrate and then co-create. Right. Um, and, and, and out of that, if I may, I would like to add to us women. I have recently had a few conversations with women about that. Mm. We also need to come together as women and be together again and having mm. a sisterhood versus yes. having jealousy and actually playing each other's out against mm. each other, including the media and the, the industry that I have to have, I would be very simple, I have to have a lipstick so I'm looking better than you. You know, and that whole competition that happens through the patriarchy to, to women, at what you know, it happens to us, it's like we have to undo this. Men cannot undo this for us. Yes, yes. Right? Exactly. So how can I not let myself, you know, being manipulated into that kind of thing? And what beauty really is has nothing to do with what we're seeing on a daily basis on billboards and women using to advertise cars and lipstick to, to any items. It's that feminine that is almost like where we have to say no, very clearly, no. I mean, yeah, thank you so much for that. Um,
So I wanted to move on to something about like, I, you mentioned it before. So like, I didn't even have to say it about how like you, me and Robin in our sense making 101 group, uh, we all like had this, one of the things we had in common was we all talked about like miraculous healing. We all came out from it from like different angles, but like you specifically, um, came out, like you mentioned that your teacher was a Joe Dispenza. Uh, like I read his book of becoming supernatural. I really liked that. Like, tapping into you know the quantum field or whatnot you know like i'm very I'm interested about that and like i told you about my healing journey 10 years of fighting my way out and then i'm here you know but it's, my journey is not even close to over it's gonna go on until i die and then i you know it was just, but it was like it was love it was it was self-love and that of my family and and believing that there was something greater that's what helped me get through that and like i was just wondering like if, if you could share how, whatever you're comfortable, your own personal journey with healing and getting to this point in your life. Okay. It's very, I mean, I'm, I'm not putting any pressure. No, I mean, like, I just, whatever you want to share. Yeah. This, thank you, thank you, okay. I, I'd love to share. Um, so when I was 16, I, you know, I think I mentioned earlier, I literally questioned um, my, my whole parents' life paradigm, mm -hmm. uh, the, the culture I grew up in, in Germany. Um, and it had the effect that I want to say I had probably my first dark night of the soul, because mm -hmm. I didn't quite know how can I ever function in this society, not alone, you know, my dad thought I was good at math. He thought I should become an accountant, and I'm like, like it no. felt like it felt like dying to me, right? I mean, <laughs> I was like, I might as well, you know. So, and it was a huge struggle to um, to get away from him and his plans for me, you know. I mm -hmm. mean, talk about a woman, you know, where I uh, I actually had the help of my aunt and my uncle. Uh, around this they just turned up magically I don't know where I didn't even ask them but they were there for me right and I was um, but that also had the effect a little later uh, that I developed an eating disorder and um, that was you know strong I, I was bulimic and at the same time, I was very much into food and into healing food. I did my first detox uh, when I was 15. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had this really desire to eat healthy and know what it does for you. But then I had the eating disorder because of emotional problems that I couldn't, didn't know what to do with. So what was interesting for me about that is when I was, went to India, basically, so the eating disorder started at 18. Um, when I went to India at 25, it stopped overnight. Wow. Wow. And this didn't even, I didn't even realize this till years later, believe it wow. or not. It was the weirdest thing. It just stopped. Right. And I came back six months later and maybe I did, you know, twice, uh, try two episodes and it never came back. Right. And, um, so and that means, means I had some healing to do also emotionally. I just knew I was more, I wasn't depressed, but everything felt like down to me. And, um, you know, and having been in India, um, I literally felt like I could stay there. At the same time, you know, people say, well, yeah, it's nice to be in an ashram and just meditate all day, but that's, you know, that doesn't mean you manage or anything, or that doesn't mean you necessarily even grow, right? Mm. Um, so what I tried for a long time with healing is, you know, I, I did cleanses and all of that. I'm, I'm nutritionist and all mm. of that. And, and what I would call, it's like, I tried to do it with, with matter, talking in quantum, you brought the quantum yeah. up and Joe Dispenza, right? So I tried to heal by, you know, obviously eating properly, having supplements and all of that, having therapy, uh, doing different kinds of therapies, all different kinds of modalities and touch for health and you name it. And there, I felt like there was very little uh, effect of that. It was um, where I'm like, yeah, it's happening, but it's very slow. Hmm. And um, then uh, 20 years ago, I started working with people particular, actually 30, 25 years ago. 
I lived in the UK for 10 years and I worked at a health farm there and have mostly like a consulting business for overcoming um, emotional issues with breathwork therapy and then also mm -hmm. taking the, um, you know, still nutrition and food and all of that. But what I realized is that the people that actually dealt with emotional issues and especially with the medium of the breath, that things started shifting much faster than if I would just go on a regime. And not only that, if I go on a health regime and on a particular diet, it had to be so precise. And if I would go off it, it would actually get worse. Not alone that I can really weaken my body by taking more and more food out, putting some pills in there, even if they're natural, and I'm actually becoming very much codependent or dependent on my external environment, which means I'm completely dependent, right, on my environmental situation. Exactly. And I had that on my, in my same experience. If I would go on vacation, I would just be thrown off, you know, even have like, you know, not the, the right circumstances. So um, it also made me feel like I need to constantly control my environment. I mean, from from situations to things to maybe people, right? And I saw that over and over in my clients as well, that they are just, you know, became actually more constricted and the maintenance was super high. You know, they had to live a very certain way and the efforts that they made and the, let's say the, the results and the freedom or the joy uh, that they experienced was actually very little. Mm. So um, I, just, I was very much interested in quantum physics uh, in my 20s. And I read uh, the book uh, from Deepa Chopra when I was 25 about quantum mm. healing. And again, I was like, wow, this is amazing. You know, I was just really like, wow, you know, I didn't understand it all. But what, I, what they were saying is depending on your state of being or your state of emotion, this actually affects your cells. And your cells can heal depending on what you inf information emotionally or, uh, you know, yeah, emotionally particularly and how you feel that that affects your state of being and your healing and that you can accelerate your healing just by the way you feel. So how do you do that, right? So I still had some issues uh, emotionally uh, probably five years ago. And then I found Dr. Joe Dispenza and he is really, he taught me um, how you really do this process, how you have basically create heart and brain coherence. And that goes very much in line with the breath from Tantra tradition or the Kundalini tradition, you know, where you're moving the life force all the way up into the pineal gland and you're actually changing your brain chemistry. And people had instant remissions, instant healing. I know, the story is amazing. It's, yeah. it's, it's, like, it's like hundreds and hundreds of people, right? And so once I started practicing that, I had literally major shifts that I was working on for 20 years in three months. I mean, for me, it was not an overnight, uh, yeah. um, you know, because my mind is very strong and my <laughs> mental, you know, my, anal my analytical yeah, you got mind. Too much masculine. Right, right, right. <laughs> right, right, right kick right. it out of there. It's like the, it's yeah. like the, the masculine is more like, you know, the control, you know, for me, I learned, I know, I understood as a learned early age, I understood to make sense intellectually mm. And feeling in the society I grew up in was not so much, you know, like uh, encouraged, mm. not alone, possibly punished. Um, so, um, and once, you know, so, so I just started noticing with the effect it has. And then the combination of the tantric breath, the Kundalini breath, uh, and the activation of the pineal gland and the change of chemistry and understanding that I'm not my thoughts, that I'm, you know, that the more of the non-dual approach as well. Yeah, exactly. But at the same time, it goes on the feeling level and having the feelings of elevated emotions like gratitude and uh, appreciation and just joy. I can actually bring those feelings up, you know, as a spiritual practice. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and then have watch my body go through the motion of, you know, whatever it is. But again, I'm not my body and my body informs me what I'm actually thinking. As they say, mm, yes. your body is the reflection of your subconscious. Yeah. It's, it's called, they call it embodied cognition. It's just like, you know, like yeah. the first brain was actually in the gut. Exactly. This brain came after. This one was formed first. Yeah. Right. And then we know, you know, from the whole Heart Mass Institute that our, the other brain is actually our heart. Oh, yeah, yeah. And we'll that is that. actually yeah. 60 times stronger. So, you know, so it was like learning for me to really open the heart again and also feeling in a very, I want to say effortless way, the pain melting away in a very different way that I felt, you know, in therapy for decades, nothing really shifted because the heart and brain coherence wasn't actually established. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, thank you so much, Thea, for sharing. I mean, like, I really appreciate it. I know it's not easy, you know, sharing this kind of stuff, but like, I know like when I hear people talk about their healing journeys, that really helped me. It helps inspire me, helps me figure out, oh, I'm on a sim I was actually on a similar journey when I was like, oh, I was getting all the supplements and getting all the food right. And it's like, oh, I still don't feel good. I started getting breath work and I started getting all this other stuff like Joe Spencer and healing. So I completely, you know, I, I understand that and, and I completely appreciate you sharing that. And I'm sure many people in the audience appreciate you sharing your story. So again, thank you so much for that. My pleasure. Thank okay. you for listening. Yeah. Okay. Um, so next, so like how this goes next. So, so I, I was up, I, I was on your Facebook. Sorry. I stalk everyone. I do all my research. Sorry for that. I'm very creepy. Um, and I saw a quote from you. You posted on your Facebook that you said, uh, focusing on one, at what I can give rather than get feels like the biggest liberation to my feeling of well being, especially in my body. It makes me feel very connected to other people instead of separate. And it's like, this is one of the things that really resonates for me. And just like, actually like literally right before, like I was like, like right before I started doing this, I was like, ah, what am I doing? I don't know what to do. But then like, what happened is I came across this podcast um, and it had this monk, his name was uh, Garanga Das. And he starts off by describing love as devotional service. And I was like, oh my God, that's powerful. I was like, what am I doing? Am I trying to save the world? Am I trying to make something, you know, successful? And I'm like, oh, I'm trying to be uh, of devotional service to other people. And like that really made me feel alive, helped me feel connected. And then like, I'm very interested in like people's definitions of love and Robin's definition of love. His own is unbiased attention. And like, that is also a big influence of me as well. It's like to be able to listen and not be in my own head, like to listen to you and to have the heart, mind connection. And not only just with myself, with you, like that's another way to express love. And that's another way that like really speaks to me. So I was just wondering, what is your personal definition of love? I love that you bring up the devotion. Um, mm. I think it is devotion and there is kind of an irony that I wanted to bring up, you know, having talked about my eating disorder because an alchemization, the, the interesting part is that I love feeding people, you know, or I love- You're a chef, of course. The, 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 <laughs> like the wrong word. I like people giving an experience yes, and that yes. to me, it's the love, you know, making a meal, setting the table, you know, and actually I, I feel the people while I'm cooking, you know, like, 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 so that was my way when I was younger, especially during my 16 and up, I would just put dinners together for people ah. and just be with people that way. And that was my way of connecting. You know, it was a nonverbal way. And somehow people just got something from that, that I didn't even know. I just knew I needed to cook when mm. I'm cooking. And it's like, I always think like, it's like a painter. I just use all the spices and all of that, but yeah. I need people who actually eat <laughs> exactly. you eat it yourself. Like, like, oh my God, exactly, like 500 pounds. Exactly. Yeah. So I was like, okay, you know, so that, um, so my definition of love is that, yeah, it's like that giving, um, that actually is then connecting, you know, but it's like the, it's the devotion for me, devotion. It's like we, I feel we, I feel we all have a unique contribution. We all have a uniqueness yes, yes. of what that is. Mm. And my biggest 
for me, I feel very fortunate that I was always in touch with it and not became an accountant, <laughs> became a nurse. Thank God, and please. Thank the divine. Yeah. That, that, was, that was for me, it's like I have to do it. Even if there's nobody there, I mm. have to, to do this. And um, you don't think about you don't think about it. You not think about does the other person like it or it, it, mm. it, it's all not in the equation. You just have to do it, you know. And I, for me, it's the greatest joy to also help other people to actually do that and just do it, you know. It's like um, uh, I heard Jim Carrey actually say something, and he. I hope I get this together. He was saying, you know, his dad. Uh, uh, he had this secure job, you know, that he didn't really like, but it felt secure. One day he got laid off. Mm -hmm. And then yep. Jim Carrey is like, how would it not be better to just go and do what you love? Exactly. And, uh, yeah. you know, and, 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 and then do something that you, that's not secure at all. Mm. And so it's just that, that devotion to me is almost like really listening to what it is. Even when you think like there is, like, like even my work, especially as a chef, it has come. I've never planned this to do other than one day I started cooking and things just started happening. Um, mm. and, uh, and it's that thing that gets you up in the morning and that it's, it's that devotion where you just are in awe of the aliveness that you feel and um, that you just can't help it. And just always go with what that is and take mm -hmm. the risk of, yeah. you know, leaving a secure job, whatever that means, right? Yeah. And, um, and I would love for all of us to support each other in a okay. co-creative mm -hmm. way to actually do that. And I think we do need support and we don't have to do this by ourselves because it's a little scary. It's a little mm, scary. Yeah. And I have to say, I have people along the way that always held my hand or that put me in the right direction, right? And I feel like this is something we, if we do that for each other and really being here and celebrate each other's uniqueness and, you know, calling it for us, you know, being in and for each other in that uniqueness, I think that's another way where co-creation and collaboration and being together comes in. Oh my God, that is amazing. Cause like, that's like when you're speaking about everyone having their unique gift, like that's why I'm doing this, right? Like, like how you're talking about how, like, how, like, you know, rebel wisdom and all these other sense making groups, you're just like, there's no way they would ever have me on. Like I said, no sane person would ever feature me, would ever have my voice. Right. It's just like, but I have a unique, I need to have a unique voice. Look at me. I'm look at me. I'm just, I'm crazy. So like, this is like my unique gift and like how you're talking about, because the way I think about it, everyone has to step up. He's saying it's very scary. Like, I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to fail. But I'm like, but it's just when you step up, there's already people here. Like there are other people right there. They're like, are you here? And there's like, no, yes, we're all right here. It's like the moment you step up, you're supported and you're giving support to others right when you step up. So like, that's what like, that, like that's a big thing of like why I'm doing this. Right. And like, uh, oh my God. And so all right, all right. Where was I talking about? Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, and, like, oh, yeah. and then like, um, how you talk about, I completely understand when you say how, when you cook things for people, it just, it, it feels like it, it nourishes your soul because it's just like, remember, I, I remember I told you, like, I was going to open up my own vegan donut shop. I was a pastry chef for here. I was going to open up my own donut shop, except instead of giving people healthy Ayurvedic food, I was going to give them donuts. But <laughs> I was, you know, at least trying not to be. So like, I completely with you on that. Yeah. And, and thank you, you know, it feels like you actually bringing me here and you are um, elevating me and, and pulling my unique gift out more because yes. I like to give this more, you know? Exactly. You like have so many gifts, Thea, so many. <laughs> thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah. But it's like, you know, the chefing for me is great, but I feel really, really, really mostly passionate and devotion, you know, to do this kind of work and to... Mm. elevate our sexuality and also really having people different experiences not as in better it's just like to give to see hey just try this out and and offering it and uh and see you know this is this this is really amazing thing i mean where we are right now 
in human history and the history of this planet uh, can be very daunting and it yeah. can be again very inspired very this is it this is it right but not with doing it devotion comes in for me to we are not doing it to save anything or anybody mm. we're doing it out of love yes you know it's like it's like you know, even, even let's say I have moments of pain, but can I offer them to the altar of love? Can oh I God, offer the yeah. pain mm. to the altar of love, right? And I'm, how am I showing up moment to moment? I don't need to sit on my meditation cushion. How am I showing up in the grocery store? How am I showing up, you know, when my friend comes and, and whatever? But I really feel like it's the time that we recognize our oneness, our connection. We know this now from the quantum physics, you know, Greg Braden is another amazing yeah. person, Bruce Lipton. We know that the genetic theory is completely out of date. Yeah. It's like this, yeah. this is it. We're moving forward from the Newtonian law of physics and into oneness consciousness and just really start, you know, being the bridge, being living that. And I feel this is happening when we come together being together activate each other sleeping potential hmm. and see what we create once we come together that's when we create we no longer create by ourselves okay. hmm. you know it's like Thich Nhat Hanh was saying you know the new um, the new Buddha is the Sangha meaning the community what yeah, you spoke yeah, yeah. about you know so this is why I just love anybody you know, that wants to take this a little deeper. I'm just here. I'm available. So yeah, Thea, I mean, like your gift, I mean, you have so many gifts, but like, especially with Tantra in this, in, the, in this time where it's like, everyone just, everyone's just going on like porn sites and like swiping through dating apps. And there's like, there's, this is really artificial connection. And just like, like, that's another modality. Cause like, uh, you know, I'm in all these different groups with the Stoa and, and uh, Rev Wisdom. We'd have like these wisdom gyms where we try to, everyone comes together and we try to like connect and be present for each other and like uh, express new ways of being with each other. And like, like you're like with Tantra, what, not just with, you know, the sex part that everyone in the country is about, but like the whole, the, the wholeness of Tantra, I think it was, is, it would be amazing gift at this point, at this point in time. And I would love to, you know, get people over to you and get you helping people as, as many people as possible. Um, so, I mean, so one thing that I came across recently, I was in a Stoa session uh, with, uh, I mentioned this in with a podcast with Robin, uh, Peter Wang. He talked about how like all, all humans, right, in this capitalistic, capitalistic world, we're all like replaceable. We're all fungible. We're all commodities. Like they could just like, they could just chew us up and throw us out. They'll hire someone else. And like, they're like, they're like standardizing, standardizing us through the, through the education system to all be like this one, you know, like, uh, you know, like standardized thing. And then I realized, wow, like, this is the world we live in. Like, each of us, we're replaceable. Like, there's nothing unique or special about us. That's what they want us to believe, this world. But then I was like, wait a minute. What if we created a world where each of us is irreplaceable? And then once I got that going in my mind, I was like, holy sh! That would completely shift. Like, like every single structure that currently exists will be just completely uprooted if every single one of us is irreplaceable. So I just wonder if you could just help imagine with me, like, what would that world look like? Like, how would we bring it about? A world where each of us is irreplaceable. That's so beautiful. I have a sense um, that this is starting with each of us. You know, it's starting um, with, first of all, just hearing you, you know, I mean, this is like, obviously I hear this the first time and I'm just letting that sink in. It's like you saying this, whoever to me, to me personally, to everybody who has just listened to you, mm -hmm. it's almost like seed, planting a seed. And in exactly. that, right? And you just take that, you just, it's like, whoa. Mm -hmm. And really take that in, take that moment. Right now, all of us, you know, the people that are listening afterwards, it's like, oh, wow, feel that. Let that move through your spine. 
And that for me would mean, you know, that if I go wherever I go right now, we're not going many places. So it's a little, you know, but it doesn't matter. We're meeting virtually, you know. It's like, can I see you as divine creation you are divine mm. and i see your uniqueness and i um i actually tell you your uniqueness like we we did mm. automatically you know but we can do that as a special practice hey and i can say to you you are bringing a aliveness into my life i feel very connected i feel your love i'm receiving that and i'm it's it's like I'm utterly grateful to you, Albert, you know, the love that you just pouring into me. And we can even meet here virtually and then each of us gives their unique gift mm -hmm. to the other. Yes. And uh, I, re I remember once doing an exercise in the, that kind of setting where we were saying to one person, there was four of us, the fifth person was sitting opposite and the four of us were telling the other person the gifts we received and the other person wasn't even aware. And that's actually the beauty that if you're really giving your gift, you don't even know. You think to you it's normal and to the other person it's the yes. total blessing, right? So if we speak that and be coming into the habit, even with a stranger, I can feel in a stranger what they're giving to me. If I'm on an airplane, right, and they're sitting next to this person, I feel, wow, it's so nice to have this person next to me. Oh, oh my God, this person is really grumpy. We're feeling all these things, mm. right? But it's like, how can I even bring out the best in someone? Maybe that's grumpy. You know, there's a reason why this person is grumpy. But can I see the best instead of the criticism? the this, the that, the, the separation, coming from separation. So that's something, you know, Albert, I see we could even start a group like that where we mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. see, where we really see that and really cultivating that with, it, with each other. I mean, <clears throat> Thea, what you just stated is actually the core of what I'm trying to do right now. Like I wrote like what my purpose of this, it was like, I want to bring out the gifts in everyone and I want to show it to them and I want to show it to the world so we could be like, oh, we, so we can co-create something beautiful. So that's exactly what I'm trying to do. So yes, I, I completely get that. And then just like, is it, is it, is it the, the meaning of namaste or is it like, is, is the meaning of that? It's like, I see the divine in you. It's like, that's like, that's pretty much what I'm trying to do there. So yes, I mean like, it's great that you could see that and like i appreciate that you seeing me i appreciate you seeing me is what i want to say thank you thank, thank you for seeing me yeah I okay. yes. yes 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 and it, it's also so fascinating i mean we we speaking here you know and there is an energetic component and you know where it feels like I can, you know, can we even start seeing, feeling this? I can feel this from you, mm. even without the words. The words, it feels like it's the icing on the cake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah? But it's yeah. like, we come, but you know, it's like you, you sometimes see a stranger and you just want to be around them. Or you see yeah. a stranger and you do not want to be around yeah. them, right? But it's like, at the same time, it's like that to me, the devotion is also, do I can see the divinity the goodness in the other person, no matter what, even if they're grumpy, 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 right? There's a reason why this person is grumpy, grumpy, grumpy. Can I elevate that? Not wait for uh, them, yeah. not wait for them to change, not going to judgment, mm. you know? But it's like, and so, it, it's so coming back to, it's making love. It's like you can use making love to, to, uh, to elevate the other person, to raise the consciousness, mm. um, it's not about self, it's, it's, it's about not just selfless service, but it's, maybe it is, you know, it's like if you are already full, if you believe you are complete, then you just want to give, you know, so it's just being full and filling yourself up first. It's like when they say pull the max oxygen mask on first, yeah, yeah. you're pretty useless, even to your kids if you're passing out and you, because you have no oxygen mask on. Yeah, it's that, that same principle. So you're filling yourself 
first in order to serve. Exactly, yeah. Not in order to separate and have more out of greed or whatever you mm. want to call it. Nothing wrong, but it's, it's all about how can I elevate? How can we elevate each other? Yeah, I mean, exactly. And like when you think about it just in the non-dual terms, it's like there is no I'm feeling myself and I'm not feeling. No, it's like we're, we're feeling. <laughs> we are being filled, like no matter what. Oh my God, I was about to say something, but I forgot. But it's okay. Oh my God, we're almost on 90 minutes. This is amazing. Um, Afia, you have been amazing, of course. Not surprised at all, but even more amazing than I thought. Um, so if I may, I would just like to close off with maybe uh, a few more questions. Like what I want to know is who or what inspires you? I mean, there's, there's people that inspire me, right? Um nature inspires me mm. always always um there is something about you know like the water the leaves the turning leaves right now it's like for me a miracle every year how this is all happening mm, yeah. right um i love rain i love snow i'm uh, i love mountains you know if we go into nature um what inspires me is kind of, you know, witnessing courage. Mm. Uh, transparency inspires me. Mm. I love coming together and uh, rocking the boat a little bit, coming together with people. Exactly. You know, also be, be, being rocked, mm. have my boat rocked, uh, being vulnerable and being in a group of people as we are with Stoa and, you know, uh, sense making where we say things that we've been asked to say things that we never told anybody and the liberation of that and the connection and the relief and the humanness and the divinity simultaneously mm. um just yeah i i what inspires me is you know it's doing something a little i don't know do you call it scary or um you know uncomfortable in with other people that we loving each other in that, you know, it's so, I always, I, I love the shadow therefore, you know, because like I said, the medicine is in the shadow exactly. and the light, the light shines on the shadow, what needs to be alchemized. And uh, there's some magic for me if I am, uh, sometimes I call it confessing in a group of people. Yeah then ex experiencing the love that comes from that and the 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 more the more love and the the evolving from that hmm. yeah and like i like like what you just stated how it feels like you're releasing when you confess like what i just did like uh, i don't know like an hour ago when i said that <laughs> like that's freak for me i'm putting this online for everyone to see including everyone in my life my family they're gonna be like oh albert's a weird version i'm like okay whatever i don't care but yeah i mean yeah i'm amazing. like yeah amazing you know. i mean just amazing <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, awesome. um and also um i was uh, looking through uh, uh uh your bio and you say that like one of the people one of your biggest inspirations when it comes to cooking in the kitchen were were the women that you cooked with in India, right? And I'm like, that just sounds amazing. So I was wondering like, like, like tell their story, like, who were they? How were they inspiring? And like, what are some like lessons that you learned from all your different travels? So the women in India, yes. So you, I was 26, my English was very, no, really, I, my English was not existing. It's just like to <laughs> yeah. me, right? It's like, oh yeah, my yeah. God, you know, very yeah. quick. And so these women only spoke, spoke some kind of Hindu, you know, whatever, and, and English. So there wasn't really much communication. Mm -hmm. And in the ancient uh, tradition, and also in Ayurveda, including Tantra, you actually receive a transmission uh, I think most of you probably know what that means. It's a transmission where you feel almost like um, you, you're getting the information through, but there has to be a certain kind of um, receptivity for that. But that receptivity, as far as I understand it, for me, was I'm born with. It was there for me to be. 
And so what I realized is for me to go to India, it was like a pull. Call it again, the pull from the evolutionary impulse. I was pulled. I was magnetized mm. to India to be, and I literally felt like I'm home for the first time in 25 years. I remember going into a, um, in, into a, um, what they call satsang. Um, it's kind of a talk, and there is often chanting there. And the second time I'm there, I'm chanting in Sanskrit. It oh. didn't make sense to me at the time, right? So it was like as though I, you know, I, 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 I didn't know myself to make out of it. I didn't even think about it. It felt normal to me till I maybe spoke about it. I'll think about it later. So it's it's kind of a transmission, um, and um, the the women there there is also we haven't spoken about embodiment. It's they were so physical. They were loving what they are doing. It's like we were loving the spices. The that's why I felt like you know I went to an art school for painting. That's what it felt like for me. Oh, wow. And you know, you learn from a master or you learn from someone that loves what they're doing so much that it almost like stick, you know, goes through you and you're experiencing, I experienced the love for the food without eating the food. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. And so I think it like activated, like the sleeping, it activated something in me that when I cook now, sometimes when I'm done, it's a meditation for me. It's like I have my music, I have my music, I have my altar, I burn some candles, I like it nice, I like my special tea, you know, and I start cooking and then let's see what's in it. I said, I don't, I, I can't remember, you know, it's like, even if I would have to speak about it, it loses its magic kind like of. You're channeling, or, yeah. Maybe, yeah, because yeah, I, you yeah. know, I've been, you know, contemplating, I've been asked to write cookbooks and I'm like, I can never do the essence of that, you uh -huh. know? I would maybe like to do and sh cook in front of people, cook with people and I've done that and it's like super fun, but to document and get all into the kind of headspace around, there's nothing wrong with that, you know, but, um, this is why I feel like I stayed always in that very personal relationship with my clients and around the food and then do dinner parties to give people a real experience and be mm. in it and enjoying it and getting the energetics of it um, and just really being in the flow with it, I guess, being in the wave. Mm. Oh yeah. my God. Amazing. And like, I've been trying to figure out how to get taste your food because I like I'm not I don't just say oh I want to eat your no I literally want to eat your food and I'm trying to understand <laughs> how I could do it I don't know if you could like have anything shelf stable or you could flash freeze I don't know but like, I actually really want to eat your food because I love Indian food I love Ay Ayurvedic okay. medicine and all that stuff so I would love I if we could actually get something. <laughs> I actually have shipped my food overnight. Oh, I, you have? I, I have, yes. I had um, one client and I moved towns and they're like, no, 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 no. We keep on going. <laughs> keep it going, yeah. So I did, you know, it was still very custom. It wasn't kind of manufactured anything. I did it, froze it. We packed it on special ice, shipped it overnight, oh you know, and there we go. You know, and it was still so. good. It was still good. Hopefully. It was good. Yeah, it oh worked. My. We're gonna it have was to good. figure something out. Seriously. Please. Okay, we figured okay, we'll, something we'll, we'll out. We'll talk about some. Okay. 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 So I just wrapped it up a little bit. Um, I believe you mentioned something about holograms, something like that. I don't know if you want to speak about that or. Well, you know, I mean, gonna... I. I don't know an awful lot about it other than, you know, hologram, the magic about a hologram is that if you split the parts, the wholeness is still in each part. Oh yeah. I just saw something on that. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. So, um, uh, so that's kind of the magic where I feel like, you know, I was just going to say very, very basic how I'm experienced. So we are all, we all have apparently separate bodies, mm. but we are all completely together in a hologram creating this mandala yeah. or a kaleidoscope. And it's the thing that we are even healing. We can get together in one room and it's called entrainment and you work on one person and you actually work on everybody else. So that oh. means when we come together, not only can we heal, we can also create magic together because we are actually one. Uh, 
Yeah, I because like the reason that I was so interested because in, I actually just I don't know if you you go on the YouTube channel. It's called I believe Science and Non Duality, and they just had something about holograms and how like the entire universe and like actually like yeah. esteemed scientists have talked about that. Yeah, so I'm very interested in in, in that and like also like. I was about to, oh yes, this is something I, I wanted to bring up before. Just like, it is amazing, like how we could have this connection. You think with like COVID happening, we can't literally be in physical space, right? That we can't have a connection. But somehow, just like in quantum mechanics, they say like, we're all connected, we're all intertwined. Like somehow you and I can share this energy, like this, this, this energy, like it's there. Like, it, and I think that's, that's incredible that we were not, we were able to hold on to that. Oh. Exactly. And it's, 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 I think that's one thing with COVID, uh, you know, that it actually almost like breaks us to away from the illusion that mm. I'm receiving your love right here and now, mm. not through the screen, but I can, we can yeah. feel each other. You know, exactly. I don't even exactly know where you sit in, right? It's like, we feel the energy and that the illusion again of separateness or the illusion that we mm. need to be together in body right and you know what what that to me um that i was really curious about when they were talking about that in the last epidemic uh, 1918 yeah. people had actually uh, ptsd from the separation situation it's like don't let that happen Oh, Let yeah, us yeah. connect on this level, on the energetic level, you know, that you, it's like when they say you can measure a butterfly's wings from the North Pole at the South Pole. Mm. And that's, I think it's the same with our human mm. connectedness, just to develop it and tune in, tune into that. Mm. It's like, you know, when you tune in, my mother is in Germany and I, I can tune in sometimes. There's something wrong. I make a phone call. Yeah. It's ex it, that's exactly it. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, we all have that. It's nothing special. It's just how much are we tuning in? How much are we aware? And uh, using this magnificent body and our bliss body to sense, to sense each other in that way. Mm. Yeah, I mean, like, modern science, they loved, like, they're, like, there are, like, valid, I said, valid uh, scientific studies that show that, like, people can sense, like, when something is wrong with someone else. It's, like, you know, like, telepathy, but, like, they're, like, no, it doesn't fit with the current paradigm. It's, like, no, but I have this evidence, like, no, it's wrong. <laughs> I'm not even going to read it. Like, they, they just do not even want to touch it because it would just destroy their world. Right. It, it's the same, you know, like coming back, I didn't finish that earlier, um, you know, Bruce Lipton, he's a biologist, and they have proven now that only 5% of diseases are uh, genetic, and you can actually change your genetic, so your genes respond to the information yes. that it gets from your feeling, from your belief and your environment. Mm. And so this is how the, the, the proteins react from the environment. So if you change and the, if, you, if you basically give positive thoughts, gratitude, not positive thoughts, elevated emotions and you know, half your mind, this is how you influence your immune system, meaning this is how you strengthen your immune system meaning this is how you make your immune system really strong for our current situation and yeah i mean yeah, yeah not believe in fear and all of that stuff so yeah i mean like it's like this whole genetic paradigm but it's like how we were talking about with the vital force or nietzsche called it the will to power whatever you want to call it this came way before genes right genes was is relatively recent compared to what is it like 17 18 billion years of, of the universe like this is something that's like central to the universe way before genes it's just like and it's, it's the information it's the will it's the it's the life force that 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 that, that goes up through us and then that we express right. so yeah i'm completely with that lovely yeah okay so we're wrapping up um oh my god again amazing so a couple questions this is a treat that i'll leave to my guests ask me one question any question and i'll answer it truthfully so whatever you want it could be a question it could be statements i'm forced to give a uh, truthful answer it can't be a social security number either I'm gonna, edit, I'm gonna edit that out. You can't say that. So what, I mean, it could be anything. It could be silly, you know, whatever. How do you know that your love will never, never run out? 
Oh my God, Thea, how dare you say that? Cause what, cause his thing, like, that's what I'm afraid of. This is what I am so afraid of that whatever this is, whatever um, is coming, rising, arising from me that I'm channeling, I'm always afraid it's going to go away. Every day I say, I do a meditation. Like every, like I do five times a day. Like I do a centering practice where I'm like, I accept the worst. I accept that I'm going to die. I accept that I have a shadow. I accept that, you know, you know, horrible things are going to happen. And I accept that this, like this show, this no, no, no mad thing. I'm not going to want to do it. I accept that it's possible. I may not no longer do it anymore. So to me, that's one of the things that I've been afraid of. And I accept that I'm still afraid, but I accept that I accept that it, it can go away. And to me, that's very important. It's just radical acceptance. And just like, I don't know if this love, it will be forever. Thing is, my physical body, it's going to go away. And this love is going to be dispersed. <laughs> it's going to be dispersed into the universe. So right. in that sense, I, that's why I don't, I don't fear death. I'm not going to say I don't fear it at all. I'm like, oh my God, if a bus is about to hit me, I'm going to move out the way. <laughs> but spiritually, I'm like, I, could, I accept death. I accept all that is. But there's a part of me that I do accept that this, this love, this manifesting love, while I'm alive in this physical form, I accept that it may go away and that I'm okay with that. Because maybe in the back of my mind, I realize it's never going to go away, even if it stops in this physical form. So I, that's, my, that's my answer. That's, that's what I'm holding, your uniqueness. It's gonna get. It's just, it's just, <laughs> you, you just, your love is just growing every time I speak oh, to you. So, uh, so yeah. So that's what I'm uh, seeing as your unique gift, and therefore it can never go. But that, that's my my offering to you. Awesome. I accept your gift, and I appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, final question: If someone were to write your life, your life story, so when it's all said and done. What is it that you wish others would take away from it? I want to say the word that initially came, just be unstoppable. Be unstoppable. And be unstoppable. And there is a smile. There is like a joy with that. And there is like a, a real party. I, I like a party mm -hmm. energy. And, and you uh. know, it's like, uh, um, where it's like, it's all, yeah, just, just be unstoppable and just uh, follow your follow your your joy follow what follow your dream you know mm. just, just even if it's hard or you know but the, the, yeah it's like the the unstoppableness uh, with a big smile awesome so you heard it here folks be unstoppable keep going because you know there's something beautiful on the other side of all this please just keep going okay <laughs> Thea, thank you so much we have made it through and we're still in one piece you know what I mean? I'm glad yeah. I wasn't, I didn't destroy you in the process. <laughs> yeah, funny. Right, yeah, so, it was yeah, so beautiful. Thank you so much for inviting me to this. I okay. love it. All right. I mean, this was amazing. Seriously, even way better than I even thought. Uh, where can people find out more about you? Um, you can actually go on my uh, chef site, which is just cheftiadixon.com. And... Um, that's all there is right now. I am, uh, I'm kind of very much in the flow with this. I love working with people. I like, you know, these days being virtually or being into private homes and working there with women or just men um, and also one-on-one. -on -one. And I also would love to get together and just work on this, maybe even create a group, maybe with mm, you. Definitely, yeah. Um, and I'm just open you know, to create um, community around this with people that feel kind of inspired with that and um, just see what's possible. Even like, what can we create? There is for me, you know, I see it as an, an ongoing process of evolution. What can we find out uh, around sexuality, around practices like that? What the next steps are? 
uh, what what does evolution want for for us to celebrate? Yeah. Um, okay, so you're here to hear, folks, chefthedixon.com. That's chef, T-H-E-A-D-I-X-O-N.com. I'll put it in the show notes. Uh, you could get apps for her, for her amazing uh, Moroccan food or whatever, Indian, Italian, everything. Uh, tantric, again, the works, whatever you want. Get, get in contact with her, form your own group, change your world, make a more beautiful place where none of us is replaceable. So that's it for another episode of Noetic Nomads. Peace out, everybody. And remember, step up because the world needs you. All right. Goodbye. All right. We are done. <laughs> there we go. Wow.